If you have a Bible, go with me. We're teaching verse by verse through the Gospel of Mark, and we're in chapter 3. Mark chapter 3. And let me, let me pray. Lord, thank you for your life-changing word, for the privilege of reading it, of studying it, of receiving it, of hearing it, and Lord, declaring it together all across our county, all across our city, all across our world. And help us, Lord, to be faithful, to not just be hearers of the word only, but also doers. And so, Lord, speak to us today through your word, by your spirit, we ask and pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. In Mark chapter 3, Jesus describes, and just want to do a quick review, he describes his, his message for us. And it's, it's found in chapter 1, verse 15. The time was fulfilled, and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. This is his message. This is why, what he came to share. This is what he came to say. Repent and believe in the gospel and the kingdom of God is at hand. That's how it begins there in chapter one as we make our way through the, the gospel of Mark. And he also gives us his method. He tells us in verse 17, follow me, I will make you to become fishers of men but he also says, and in, in further down from that, let's go into the next town that I may preach there also, because for this purpose I have come forth. So he, he came to give a message of repentance and of belief, and that the kingdom of God is at hand. And the method would be preaching and making his disciples fishers of men. And then last week, we saw he chose his men. He, he, he says he appointed 12 that they might be with him and that he might send them out also to preach. So we have his message, we have his method, and we have his men. And here in chapter 3, he comes back to Capernaum. It's kind of his adopted home. He comes back to this little town on the Galilee Sea. If you ever go to Capernaum, you'll, you'll see it there. It sits right over the Galilee. You can look down the hill. And as he makes his way back there, as he arrives there, we, we pick up the story in chapter 3, verse 20. It says, then the multitude came together again so that they could not so much as eat bread. Now, now, Jesus is back in Capernaum, the house, many believe, is the house of Peter and his wife, and his seems his mother-in-law perhaps lives there, and they're there in the house, and it's either so crowded that there's not the ability to prepare food, or, or either it's, 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 it's so much going on, and so many people, and Jesus is so absorbed by his ministry that he doesn't even eat that food can't be served or food is neglected. And in this culture at this time, meals were almost rituals. They, they, they were uh, something that, that, that was a time when people sat down and they fellowshiped and it was a very important thing in the, in the routine and the ritual of the day for the early Jewish century. And also food was scarce in that time. And anyone who refused to eat, well, it goes on to say, Jesus must be out of his mind. It's like they're giving away free nuggets at Chick-fil-A, and no one wants it. No one's eating. And, and it tells us there in verse 21, as, as, as we read this passage of Scripture, his own people heard about this, and they went out to lay hold of him, for they said, he's out of his mind. And some well-meaning friends, we'll see this later, send a message to his mom, to his family, and they're going to come and try and rescue Jesus from this, whatever's going on with him. He's not eating. He's so absorbed in this ministry. And there's a story told, maybe you've heard it, of Thomas Edison. 
that inventor who worked tirelessly hours upon end without food, without sleep. He, he, he was approaching the discovery of the incandescent light. And they'd bring him food, they'd try to get him to go to bed, and, and he would just ignore trays of food. He, he would stay up all night. And his family feared that Thomas, well, that he would get sick, that he'd collapse. And there's been a lot of studies by psychologists who say when a person is so engaged in his work, when he's, he or she's involved in some kind of creative expression of themselves, something that they love and that they're passionate about, it seems that all other values and, and, and all other things fall into second place or are off to the side of priorities. And this might be the case with Jesus. He's so engaged. He's so passionate. It, it reminds me of, of, of the story of, of, of John chapter 4. You don't have to turn there, but you, you remember this story of Jesus with the woman at the well. Listen to what it says in John chapter 6. There's an interesting, well, John chapter 4, verse 6. Jesus is, is tired. He's, he's hungry. It says, Jacob's well was there, and being tired, wearied from his journey, he sat by the well, and it was about the sixth hour. And a woman of Samaria came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, give me to drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. Jesus has this encounter at this well. You know this story. And he's tired, it says. His disciples go to get food in the city, so obviously they're hungry. And this woman comes, and Jesus engages her in a conversation, and she's had five husbands. And she's now living with a man outside of marriage. And he reveals to her that he's the Messiah. And she runs off to tell the whole town and bring the whole town back to Jesus. And it tells us as she leaves, as Jesus has revealed himself, at this point the disciples came. And they marveled that he talked with a woman, yet no one said, what do you seek or why are you talking with her? The woman left her water pot, went into the city, and, and said to the men, Come and see a man who told me all things that I ever did. Could this be the Christ? And they all went out of the city and came to him. And in the meantime, his disciples urged him, saying, Rabbi, eat, you're hungry. And he said, Well, I have food to eat of which you do not know. Jesus, we, we got food. He shows no interest. Tired, hungry Jesus at the well, sitting in the middle of the day, waiting for disciples to bring lunch. He asks a woman for water. Disciples come back. They find not tired, weary Jesus, but energized Jesus. His attention, his heart is somewhere totally different now than lunch and being tired. It's an amazing scenario. Disciples urge him to eat. It's, it's an exasperation. Come on, Jesus, you need to eat. In verse 32, he says, I have food to eat of which you do not know. What? We leave you tired and thirsty and we come back, you're all fired up, you're all hyped up, you're, you're not hungry. I mean, what is going on? Disciples said to one another, has anyone brought him anything to eat? Did Jesus door dash this thing? What's going on? And Jesus said, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. This is amazing, real principle that you can find yourself sometimes involved in that which the Lord is using you to do with others, with ministry. And it can be extremely nourishing. As you give yourself to, to his work, there's a, there's a sort of a rejuvenation, a sense of your a feeding of your soul, a renewed zeal and a strength. And this is what's happening here, and I think this is what was also happening in Mark chapter 3. Jesus is, 
in the midst of all this ministry and lives are being touched and changed and withered hands are being healed and people are preaching the gospel and crowds are gathering and Jesus is like, oh yeah, I'm supposed to eat. Have you ever been in a scenario like that where you're just so engaged that food sort of doesn't mean anything to you all of a sudden? Some of you are saying, John, that's never happened to me at all. <laughs> and some of you are saying, I wish that would happen to me once in a while. Well, in our text, back to Mark chapter 3, and the scribes came down in verse 22, after some have said he's out of his mind. They came from Jerusalem and said, well, he has Beelzebub, and by the ruler of demons, he cast out demons. They recognize Jesus is, well, he's different, obviously. But not only that, some of his own cohorts are saying he, he's perhaps out of his mind. He's not eating. He's so busy. He's so engaged. And so they jump all over this, and they begin to twist it, these Pharisees, these scribes. Instead of saying he's out of his mind, they say something far beyond that. They claim that Jesus is demon-possessed. Jesus is in league with Satan. All the charges against his message, his values, his deity, well, they, they go to this massive confrontational accusation. He's not the son of God. He's the son of Satan. They, they accuse him of being satanic. It's not just a sin of the flesh or even a sin of blasphemy. Both of those can be forgiven. But, but look what happens here. And the scribes who came down from Jerusalem. And, and remember, this, this confrontation, this, this whole thing between Jesus and the religious leaders of the day has been heating up. It's becoming more tense. It's becoming more confrontive. And now they're saying he has Beelzebub. And by the ruler of the demons, he's casting out demons. And so Jesus, well, he responds. He he. he he corrects their thinking. Now, now, let me have your attention for just a second. In chapter 2, they denied his authority to forgive sins when he healed the paralytic. They said, who do you think you are, basically? He says, none, none can forgive sins but God himself. They criticized him then after that for calling and forgiving Levi, the tax collector. And, and they made this statement. He eats and he drinks with sinners. So, so here's what's happening. Jesus, first of all, claims to forgive sin, and now he's hanging out with hated tax collectors and sinners. They challenged his commitment and his devotion because he, well, he didn't fast like all the other rabbis. In fact, he even would go through grain fields on the Sabbath, and sometimes he would thresh the wheat in the hands, which was allowed, but this was the Sabbath. And so he was healing people and feeding people, and all against the tradition and oral law of the Sabbath. And then he goes and heals a withered hand on the Sabbath. And things are, well, they're, they're heating up. And the Pharisees, you saw in last week in chapter 3, verse 6, they went out and immediately plotted with the Herodians against him how they might destroy him. So, so here's the thing. He's forgiving sins. He's hanging out with tax collectors. He's not fasting the way he should. He, he puts the needs of people for healing and food before tradition and oral law. He heals and he eats grain. And now, listen, this is sort of the capstone of the whole thing. Now they get to the place where they say, he's being used by the devil. He's got the demon of Beelzebub. And Jesus responds here in chapter 3 with some pretty clear logic. He says in verse 23, how can Satan cast out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom will not stand. If a house is divided against itself, that house cannot stand. 
And if Satan has risen up against himself and is divided, he cannot stand but has an end. No one can enter a strong man's house, and he's talking about Satan's house, and plunder his goods unless he first binds the strong man, then he will plunder his house. If I'm doing this, he says, by Satan's power, then Satan's working against himself? He says, I don't think so. Basically, he says to them, you're out of your mind. I'm not out of my mind. For you to even think that, it's like a house or kingdom divided. It can't stand if it's divided and opposes itself. Satan will destroy himself and bring about his own destruction by working against himself. In fact, he goes on to say, no one can enter a strong man's house and plunder him unless he first binds a strong man and then he will plunder his house. So two obvious conclusions from Jesus' response to this. I can't be working with Satan. In fact, I'm destroying Satan's work, which means he's more powerful than Satan. And this is his response. And then we have this often troubling and I think misunderstood passage. Assuredly, I say to you, all sins will be forgiven the sons of men and whatever blasphemies they may utter. All, all sins and, and even blasphemy. But whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit never has forgiveness, but is subject to eternal condemnation because they said he has an unclean spirit. Jesus is being led and empowered, I, I think we know, by the Holy Spirit. It's obvious from the beginning of his ministry. You, you, you know when Jesus starts his ministry, he's baptized in the Jordan River and the Holy Spirit comes down in the symbol of a dove. And then he starts his public ministry. It, it's a sign, it's a signal that this ministry is empowered and led by the Holy Spirit. And since the very beginning of his ministry, in Capernaum, here in the Gospel of Mark. They questioned, they criticized, they challenged everything that he was doing. And everything he was doing was from the Father, by the power of the Holy Spirit. And now they're saying Jesus' work is not by the Father, not by the Holy Spirit, but he does things by a demonic spirit. And Jesus says, he who blasphemes against the Holy Spirit has forgiveness, but is subject to eternal, never has forgiveness, but is subject to eternal condemnation because they said he has an unclean spirit. Wow. Now, the word blaspheme means to insult, to reject, to revile, and to slander. They're now saying that the spirit that is empowering Jesus to heal to forgive and to cast out demons is not a godly spirit, not a holy spirit, but a demonic spirit. So this progression of opposition to God's spirit that is revealing the kingdom of God, and that's what Jesus is doing, the kingdom of God has come. It's at hand. And it's being revealed by the power of the Holy Spirit working through Jesus in all these different ways we've seen up into these first three chapters. But they say, no, it's revealing the kingdom of Satan because he's empowered by Satan. And Jesus' message, once again, is the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe. But they're rejecting Jesus. They're rejecting his message rejecting the power and the evidence of the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit came into the world to review and, and, and to reveal and to restore and to draw and to convict our hearts of sin. Repent, he says, and believe. The work of the Holy Spirit is to renew our hearts and to bring us into relationship with the Father. It, it'd be kind of like this. If you were dying, you had a 
certain disease and a doctor comes into your room and he has a remedy, he has a cure that will heal and restore your life. And he explains to you, he, he even demonstrates to you that others have been healed by this and you can too, but you reject it. You criticize it. You oppose it. You, you refuse to accept it. And you know what happens? What do you think happens? You die. <laughs> There's a cure. Th th There's a remedy for the disease of your sin and my sin. And the Holy Spirit applies it to our life. But if you resist it, if you reject it, if you oppose it, if you criticize it, well, there's no forgiveness. To, to continually reject the goodness and the call and the evidence of the Holy Spirit can leave a person when they die without forgiveness. And there's no forgiveness after death. One sin that is unforgivable is a life of long rejection of the salvation of Jesus Christ that is revealed by the power and the conviction of the Holy Spirit. Jesus made it very clear as he spoke to Nicodemus, God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son that whosoever believe in him would not perish but have everlasting life. He didn't come to condemn the world but that the world through him might be saved. And the Pharisees and these scribes are basically trying to work their way into heaven. Basically putting oral law and tradition and, and rules and regulations and rituals before the power and the beauty and the call of the gospel through the Holy Spirit. It's kind of like this. Maybe you've heard this story before. A woman had been married to a man, and he was very cruel, he was very harsh, and he was very controlling. And every day before he left for work, he would leave her a list and say, these things better be done by the time I get home. I want dinner at 5.30. Clothes better be washed. They better be ironed. They better be folded. The, the, the furniture better be dusted. The, the carpet better be vacuumed. And when he'd get home, he would check the list. Well, eventually she died. Some say he was poisoned. I'm not sure what really happened. <laughs> but eventually he died and she remarried. Married a beautiful husband, a, a, a kind, loving man. And one day he came home from work and found her sitting in a chair crying. He goes, what's the matter? She goes, oh, I was, I was straightening up and doing some laundry and vacuuming. And I, I opened a drawer and I found one of those lists from my first husband. And he says, well, you don't get those anymore. Why are you crying? And she said, well, as I was reading through the list, she says, I realize I still do all those things but not because I have to, but because I love you. And that's the difference between law and love and the power of the Holy Spirit. You don't do all those things because you have to. We don't, we don't go to church because we have to. We don't, we don't follow the Lord because we have to. We don't have to do anything because we have to. We do it because we love Him. Jesus doesn't say they had committed this sin he says they're dangerously close, so unwilling to recognize and to believe that Jesus is God's true son, the one who, who has been sent, and, and instead, instead of receiving and recognizing very clearly who he is, I mean, he's demonstrated it over and over again in these very first three chapters. Instead, they say, no, he, he's satanic. He's in league with Satan. And here's the thing, they've allowed themselves based on their own pride and, and their own stature and, and, and what they want to receive from people, they're self-deceived and on their way to this unforgivable sin. Completely rejecting over and over again the Holy Spirit. And then it says in verse 31, his brothers and his mother came and standing outside they sent to him calling. So they've received a message. 
And, and they've, they've showed up because, well, Jesus is out of his mind. He's not eating. He's so absorbed in ministry. And the multitude was sitting around him. And look, your, your mother and your brother's out, outside seeking you. Somehow someone got a message into the center of the group. And Jesus gives a very interesting answer. Who's my mother or brothers? See, he is out of his mind. He doesn't know his own mother's or brothers. No, that's not what it's saying. He looked around in a circle at those who sat about him, most likely his men. And he said, here's my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of God is my brother, my sister, and my mother. What an interesting response. Mary's out there. And Mary had with her the siblings of Jesus, his half-brothers. She's not a perpetual virgin, Mary isn't, as some groups claim she was. These siblings of Jesus are here, the half-brothers. And you see the mother of Jesus coming to Jesus. And I think this is interesting. He doesn't respond to her. He doesn't stop everything and say, whoa, wait just a second. Mom's trying to get a message to me. He doesn't support the idea of her being a special way to get to him. Let me just say that. And no aversion to the Catholic message. But we don't have to go through anyone else but Jesus. We can go straight to him. No other mediator is needed. And to become part of the true family, our relationship is demonstrated. Jesus says, whoever does the will of God, those are my family. He's saying not that you come into his family through obedience or by works, but once you become part of his family, Well, when you are in relationship with Jesus, the Spirit of Christ, the Holy Spirit lives in you and you're able and empowered to do his will. Jesus, those are the true members of my family. It's not knowing theology, although I think theology is a wonderful thing and it's an important thing. I mean, when I first got saved, I knew nothing about the Bible. But you know what? I knew I was in the family. I knew as a Christian but I was just a dumb Christian. And so I I felt called to go to to Bible college. I went off to an Assembly of God Bible college and I spent four years there. And you know the best thing I got out of that? My wife. (laughs) And some theology. And and I came out of that Bible college still wondering, gosh, I don't feel equipped to, to really... I don't know the Bible. That I, 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 Maybe I spent too much time talking to Lynn. Maybe I should have studied harder. So I went off to seminary. I went to a Baptist seminary. I, I graduated from there with a Master of Divinity, and I, I felt a little more uh, prepared, although now I didn't know if I was simply God or Baptist. <laughs> and neither did anyone else I sent a resume to. Who is this guy? And then God introduced me to Calvary Chapels. And in 1983, I started a little church in the school right down the street. And not because I knew a lot of theology, not because I kept the law, not because I had strong emotional feelings, although I do for the Lord. And I feel like I have a a fairly balanced grasp now of theology of Scripture. Not because I keep rules or rituals, although I, I love to take communion and, and, and be involved in certain prayer things, but it boils down to There was a time in my life where I received Christ as my Savior. And the Holy Spirit came drawing me and calling me and knocking. And then he gave me the power to live and walk in obedience. So so what Jesus is saying, it's it's not the the people who keep these rules and these regulations or who have strong emotions or, or might be related to me because of some biological thing, but the true family are those who've received Jesus Christ as Savior and follow him in obedience and love. They do the will of the Father. 
reminds me of a, a, a passage in, in the Gospel of, of John. I'll just turn there real quick and read it to you. Je- Jesus. has been teaching and they asked him a question. He said, what shall we do that we may do the works of God? This is what Jesus said. The work of God is that you believe in him who he sent. And that's the beginning of it. The Holy Spirit draws us to Christ, empowers us to serve Christ, guides us in all truth of Christ, comes alongside to comfort us. The Holy Spirit equips us to serve with different gifts. He doesn't come so, well, I can turn over a new leaf. I don't know about you, but I tried that many times in my life. I need to change. I need to turn over a new leaf. It's New Year's. I'm going to start again. It, the Holy Spirit doesn't come so I can join a Bible study. Nothing wrong with Bible studies. Holy Spirit doesn't come to, so I can try harder to be good, although there's nothing wrong with trying. Holy Spirit doesn't come so I can go to church or even call myself a Christian. The Holy Spirit comes that you might receive the Lord Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, be forever changed. And then as you fall in love with him, you begin to walk in obedience to him. Not because you're under some religious law or legislation, because the Holy Spirit has convinced your heart who the Son of God is, that he's your Savior and your Lord. And so these guys come along. After all that Jesus has done, listen, and here's the wonderful thing. After all that Jesus has done to continue to reject him and oppose him and challenge him and criticize him and disbelieve in him and then get to the point where you actually accuse him of being possessed by Satan, Jesus said, boy, you guys are in big trouble. You're on the edge of entering into a thing in your life where you cannot be forgiven. If you keep down this road. See, here's the thing. You might, you might be here today and maybe you've never trusted in Jesus Christ. And I understand that. Sometimes it takes a while. But, but these guys had seen over and over and over again. And instead of beginning to open their heart, instead of the hardness of the heart being cracked and, and begin to dissolve, it was getting harder and harder and harder till it got to the point where Jesus was doing so many miraculous and good things that they were pointing at him and saying, you know what? He's not of God. He's of Satan. And Jesus just stopped. He said, you guys are dangerously close to falling into a hardness of heart and a life that could lead and direct you to a place where you would be unforgiven when you died. See, see, here's the thing. I think that any true seeker who really wants to know for sure if Jesus Christ is who he said he is, you ask him to reveal himself to you, and I guarantee you he will. He just will. I remember over and over again when I first became a believer, we, we had all these friends. It was, you know, I was 18 years old. It was uh, 1971 or two. And we had all these long-haired surfer friends because that's the crowd we would, and they would say, I can't believe you guys are Christians. Uh, you're not doing this. You're not doing that. They didn't call us Satan. But they didn't invite us to their Satan parties anymore. And we would tell them things like, we didn't know what to tell them. We were new Christians. And we would say something like this, hey, if you pray and ask Jesus to prove to you he's real, I guarantee you he will do it. And over and over again, we'd see our friends show up at church. They'd be like, what are you doing here? I, I, I did what you said. And, and God has a way through the Holy Spirit, 
If you're a believer, you know this, to reveal to you that he's real. He comes and he knocks and he calls and he begins to create circumstances. And, 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 and he, I, I can remember the first time he began to speak to me. And it was in the weirdest way. I used to love music. Anybody have a, well, eight track? <laughs> so I'm driving my little Volkswagen, going surfing. I used to love to listen to James Taylor. And one time he said, won't you look down upon me, Jesus? I thought, Jesus? My brother had been telling me about Jesus. Now James Taylor's telling me about Jesus? <laughs> uh, and all of a sudden, everywhere I'd go, I'd start hearing about Jesus. And finally, I said, Jesus, if you're real, show yourself to me. And he so, so came at me in so many different directions that finally I, I said, okay, the evidence is, is becoming overwhelming. Can't be coincidental. And it started in a, in a little bedroom on Florida Avenue here in Gulf Breeze where my mom lived for 40 years. I, I, I knelt down and prayed and said, well, Lord, I, I think you're real. And the next thing I knew, that Wednesday night, I was in church. And first time I'd been in church in a long, long time. And I opened my heart to Christ. And he, he kept coming at me over and over and over, just like he was coming at these, these religious leaders. And, and instead of hardening my heart, I said, Lord, if you're real, soften my heart. And what an amazing thing amazing journey it's been. Aren't you glad that, that it doesn't just stop at salvation? It continues to go all through your life. He, he says, not, not only will, will I call you, not only will I save you, but I will bring you into a whole new kingdom where I rule and have authority over you, and I will make you fishers of men. And, and it's amazing that God will use someone like me and someone like you to be one beggar telling another beggar where they can find true bread. And that's our call. God has called you, he has called me, and he's warned us through his scripture not to harden our hearts, but that we can be a part of and be involved in this amazing thing called, called the kingdom of God is at hand. And we can find great comfort and great calling and great, I believe, encouragement and equipping and, and power through the Holy Spirit. And I would submit to you that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. I've had the privilege of traveling to a lot of places as a pastor, helping out with different conferences around the country and, one, and around the world. And one of the things that struck me the most is everywhere I would go, You'd see giant churches and crosses and, and people following Jesus Christ. And, and it's, you know what? You wake up to the fact that, man, this, this, this man, Jesus, who only spent three years, never traveled outside of Israel, this small little country of Israel, ne never went anywhere else but mostly to the Jews of his time, has impacted the whole world. And guess what? He's not finished yet. He's called you, he's called me to be a part of the kingdom of God, to not harden our hearts and to allow the Holy Spirit to use us as a church and as individuals to be fishers of men.